welcome back to Megan's Science Class. We are going to continue talking about populations, particularly studying populations. So if we recall, a population is essentially just a number. A number that tells us how many individuals there are of a certain species at any given point in time in a specific area. So it's just the number. And again, we're only looking at one species in particular. As soon as we have more than one species, it's a whole different thing. So, the next thing I wanted to talk about with you guys was something called population density. So, basically we are comparing the number of individuals of a species, the population size, and we're comparing that with the area that they're living in. It's actually a mathematical concept and we do get a numerical value when we calculate it and that tells us uh, if there's like a population that is basically overwhelming the certain area or if the population is in danger and not doing so well. So the mathematical formula is as follows. Population density is equal to your population size divided by your area. So, if you have a really large population and a very small area, you are going to have a very high population density. Contrary, if you have a very small population and a very big area, you're going to have a very, very, very small population density. Let's take a look at some examples. As you can see, there is a pretty big space behind me. There are a couple of large trees. Some of them are elm, some of them are poplar. There's a couple of hawthorn trees in there. Um, but most of the plants that live in the space behind me are grass types or uh, flower types. So if we're looking, let's say, at the population of the hawthorn tree, Let's assume that there are about four or five hawthorn trees in this area. There's so much space in between that you can move around freely. You don't have to worry about bumping into the trees while you're walking through them. So we would say that this area here, in terms of hawthorn tree population, is less dense. It is small density. You're going to have a very small number. In fact, you might even have a decimal number. Now this area has quite a few asters. These purple flowers are heart-shaped heart -shaped leaf aster. And in this small area, you can see that there are a lot of them. In fact, I don't even want to bother counting them, even though it's a very small area. So based on my general observation of seeing so many of these asters in this small area, I would say that the population density of the aster in this area is very high. I don't even have to do any math to figure it out. I can just look and see for myself. So we looked at a couple of examples of what a low population density would look like and what a high population density would look at. Let's take some time now and do a little bit of math. So let's take a look at an example on how to calculate population density. Here we have a forested area and we have a couple of blue jays hanging around um, and we want to calculate the population density of the blue jays in this forest. Let's assume that we have an area of 10 kilometers squared. Now we know that our population size is six blue jays and i'm just going to put bj for blue jays now the population density formula is your population size divided by your area so in this case we would take our six blue jays and we would divide it by our 10 kilometers squared. We would end up, when we do this division, 6 divided by 10 gives me 0 0.6. Now we have to keep these units, and I'm just going to rewrite them as a different kind of 
fraction. It's a bit of a slanted fraction. But essentially, this is what you're going to have as your answer. Your population density is 0.6 blue jays per kilometer squared. Now the last thing I wanted to talk to you guys about today was something called ecological factors. They're also known as environmental factors. And they are things that exist in the environment that affect the day-to-day -day lives of all living organisms in that habitat or in that environment. There are two types. There are biotic factors, which are factors that directly relate to the living organisms, or they could relate to parasites or any interactions in between the living organisms. And then there are the abiotic factors, which relate to things that are not considered to be living, per se. So, some examples of abiotic factors could be the lack of access to water, it could be the amount of sunlight, and it could even be the soil pH. Now let's take a look at a biotic factor. As you can see, I'm in a pretty dense forest right here. There are lots of different tree species around here, and as you can see that there are some smaller plants, and then there are some much bigger plants. Now, the biotic factor that I want to look at is something called competition, and we'll learn more about that in the future, but let's just play with this idea for a moment. Can you imagine how much work it takes for the little plants to get all of the nutrients they need from the soil, all of the water they need, and all of the sunlight when they have to compete with all of these large trees? You see, these large trees will take up a lot of the resources that the smaller plants need. And that is an interaction between the two different plants. And that is what makes it a biotic factor. As soon as there are two living organisms that are competing for the same thing, whether it's food, water, shelter, or anything, then it becomes a biotic factor. As you can see, I am standing in the remains of an old building, made of concrete, right? Normally we don't have plants growing in our buildings unless, you know, we've designed it that way. But because this is a building that is not being maintained anymore, things have happened to the concrete here. Cracks have started forming. And when cracks form, that means that seeds can get in between the cracks. That means that water can get in between the cracks. And that means that sunlight can get in between the cracks. And that allows for plants to start growing. And when they start growing, their roots can shape the earth underneath the concrete and cause it to buckle. But what if the concrete didn't have any cracks? So you can see that there are some places in this area that don't have cracks in the concrete. There are no plants growing there. And that's because the concrete prevents water and sunlight from reaching the roots and reaching the seeds inside the soil. The seeds cannot sprout in order for them to grow. So human infrastructure is one example of an abiotic factor that basically inhibits the growth of plants or animals. So, let's break it down. Population density is a comparison between the number of individuals of a species with the area that they live in. It's a mathematical equation and we use it to determine whether species are doing well or whether there are species that are not doing so well and possibly need protection. The next thing that we talked about were ecological or environmental factors. And we learned that those are things that affect living organisms in a given environment. We also learned that there are two types. There are abiotic factors, which are non-living factors, such as access to water, access to sunlight, or even soil chemical properties. And then we learned that there are biotic factors, which involve living organisms. So it could be things like predation, it could be things like disease, it could be things like competition for resources. And that's on populations.
I'll see you next time when we talk about communities.